It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Jason Cowan. He's uh, with the Military Surface Deployment and Distribution Command, uh, Transportation Engineering Agency, and you can see the acronym up there, basically in the DOD on the transport transcom side of things. Uh, he's had about 11 years of experience there. He's currently the Traffic Engineering Branch Chief. He's had 13 years of experience uh, with FHWA, an extensive uh, experiences in the Air National Guard and the Army Reserve. He's also a graduate of the University of Missouri. We we're just talking football, and I didn't tell him this, but I, I actually kind of reg regret not playing Missouri like we used to when we were both in the Big Eight and the Big Twelve. Uh, they, I think, they have a tougher one being in SEC than we have in the Big Ten. But we're all. <laughs> uh, but so happy to have him here, and he's going to be talking about the Transportation Engineering Agency. So, Jason, thank you for being here. Thank and you. We look forward to your talk. You're dating yourself. Oh. Thank you, sorry. Um, you're, you're dating yourself a little bit by calling it the Big Eight. Um, I, the Big Seven, I think. For, for those on the webinar, if I slip and call it Rala, you'll know what I'm talking about, hopefully. Uh, that's, that's going a ways back. Um, I'd like to issue a thank you to Dr. Roulette and his staff for, for inviting me here and the opportunity to participate. A um, couple of caveats or rules I'll throw out here. Uh, we in the DOD like to use, I just used one right there. An acronym. We use a lot of acronyms um, everywhere. I try. I will try to spell them out as much as possible. If I don't, uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, it, sometimes I forget. I'll throw them out very, very quickly. Um, feel free to ask questions. I do have a couple of pause points in here. I'm going to use them as segues into different topics where I will pause to ask questions. So, so feel free to ask questions. Um, just a little background uh, for myself. Uh, I spent 13 years with the Federal Highway Administration, bounced around different locations. Um, I've served in Kansas, closest to Nebraska. I've served in Kansas and South Dakota for a few years. Um, my wife made me move from Pierce, South Dakota, as much as I loved it up there. Um, hunting and fishing is probably about the best you'll find in the, in, in the country. Um, after that, I went to work for uh, Department of Defense uh, at Scott Air Force Base right outside of St. Louis. Um, for about uh, eight, eight and a half years, I worked in a program known as our Highways for National Defense program. Uh, that's kind of a, a glorified liaison between DOD entities and civil sector highway departments, uh, state transportation departments, Federal Highway Administration, US DOT. I'll talk a little bit more about that organization in, uh, in a little bit. Um, and about a year and a half ago, I had the opportunity to move into this function, uh, into traffic engineering branch. Um, uh, it really just interests me. It's, it's kind of bread and butter. It's one of the few entities that I think is probably the most hands-on engineering in my organization that I can get into. So it even allows me the opportunity every once in a while just to, to grab a small project and work on it myself, whether it's a safety issue at an installation or, or something like that. So it, it keeps my hand in things despite all my program management aspects in the DOD, uh, that's kind of nice. Uh, the other side of that, uh, and I'll make some selfish plugs here in a little bit for engineers, for both civil, civil uh, civilian employees in the DOD and in the military, because I have had the opportunity to serve uh, for about 27 years in the Air National Guard, various locations, uh, about 10 of those enlisted, and the last 17 as a civil engineering officer in the Air Force. Um, it's been a great opportunity. I've, I've got to travel some phenomenal locations and some not go so good locations uh, in that time. Um, and it's just been a wonderful opportunity for me. Uh, so, um, and there's an Air National Guard unit in just about every location. So don't discourage it. There's one right here in Lincoln. I think it's a C-130 unit, it used to be anyway. Um, so that's enough background for me on there. My clicker here, here we go. All right, uh, every DOD presentation has to have an agenda. So I'm throwing one out for you here. I'm probably gonna go off topic. Uh, if you ask a question, I will follow shiny squirrels wherever they lead me to. So uh, um, just a bit of an overview on why I do what I do. Uh, some of the DOD specific issues that makes us a little bit different from other traffic engineering entities. I'll try to explain the organization of the DOD all the way down to who I work for. Uh, talk about my traffic engineering branch a little bit, what we do and what we don't do. And then I'm gonna hit on a, a specific item within our infrastructure that you're probably not going to see too often, an entry control facility. It's got some uniqueness to it that you're not going to see anywhere else in the, in the world. Uh, and I'll just highlight some of those big areas. Um, I will just touch on the surface of entry control facilities. We, uh, in our organization, we teach a seminar and we spend almost an entire day talking about traffic engineering and entry control facilities so it can get kind of in depth. Uh, in addition, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, their uh, protective design center over in Omaha, uh, they do an entire week-long class on entry control facility design. So 
jumping in. Uh, I'm going to show my base. This is Scott Air Force Base. Um, I work very closely to where you see the number two there. Uh, these numbers here represent gates that we have at our facilities. So Scott Air Force Base, let's talk about the DOD as a whole. Uh, we're a pretty large entity. We hire millions of people, civilians, uh, active duty military. And in addition to we have a, a number of contractors that work for us on and off our bases. Uh, all our DOD installations cover about 27 million acres of property over about 4,700 sites worldwide. So Scott Air Force Base, size wise, we're on the smaller side. There's only about 3,700 acres here at Scott Air Force Base. Uh, compared to like White Sands Missile Range in Texas, which is about a million acres, or Fort Bliss, Texas, which is about 340,000 acres. Uh, different bases, they range all the way from a small guard unit uh, here in Lincoln to a, a massively large facility, like I said, like White Sands. A military base, for the most part, is a self-contained city. We have all the same aspects you're going to see on a military base that you in the city. we got a Walmart that's known as our base exchange or post exchange. We have a grocery store that's our commissary. We have a gas station. We have the beer store. We have housing areas, hospitals. The only thing at Scott Air Force Base that we do not have that you'll find on other military installations is a school. Some of the larger facilities, uh, Fort Leavenworth, just south of here, um, they have a school actually on their base. Ours is very close. It's just off to the, to the bottom left of the picture there. Generates a lot of pedestrian activity outside of our uh, housing areas. Um, we do have the unique aspect because we're close to a metro area. We do have a metro transit stop. Our metro rail in St. Louis runs from the airport uh, on the west side of St. Louis and stops right there close to uh, gate five that I'm showing on there. The, the, one of the issues that's different for us at, a, uh, at our base compared to a city is our points of entry in our state are limited to gates, access controlled gates. You have to have a reason to get on that base and you have to process through that um, in, in order to get in there. Now, our, the problems that we deal with in our base is the population of Scott Air Force is, is about 15,000 personnel. Uh, that's civilian and military personnel working on the base. That doesn't include the contractors that come on the base day to day. That doesn't include uh, general construction workers, the folks that do the, the landscaping, mowing the yards, retirees going to the BX, going to the clinics, the pharmacy, you name it. Now that 15,000 people, uh, plus everybody else that comes onto that base, generates about in a peak day, about 15,000 trips through in and out of our gates. In a peak hour, gates one, two, and three, you'll see up there, generate about 3,300 vehicles in a peak hour. Uh, it's pretty high demand. Um, at this particular facility, gates one and two are open 24 hours a day. Um, gates three and four are only open in the morning peak periods. Four is open all day long because that's our commercial truck processing gate. Five and six are for pedestrian access only. Uh, but like I said, we generate a lot of traffic. Now within this base, if you go on to one, uh, start looking around, you're gonna see the same traffic engineering aspects that you're gonna see outside here. You'll see the same stop signs, some same misplaced stop signs, um, the, the same traffic signals, school zones, crosswalks, you name it, we've got it. Uh, we issue, deal with some of the same issues that, that they're dealt with out here. As I mentioned, some of the differences at our entry control facilities, we put up what's known as active vehicle barriers. These are barriers designed to stop a threat vehicle from penetrating our installation. Um, at some of our, our larger in, uh, Army and, and Marine Corps installations, you're gonna find entire roadways that are closed down for morning physical training periods, things that you have to deal with. Some of, uh, some of our other installations, you might see a tank convoy going down a roadway that you have to contend with, a, a line of military vehicles, that type of thing. Just minor differences. Now, this is just kind of an appetizer to show you what we're dealing with. Um, but one of the problems that we do with traffic engineering in our military installations, is we have engineers working in our bases. Scott Air Force Base has a civil engineering squadron. Their responsibility is to manage the infrastructure and facilities on this base. So from cradle to grave, they're doing the work there uh, and doing the operation and maintenance of it. The problem is we don't hire a lot of traffic engineers. Uh, we have a handful uh, at a couple of different installations, that's just because their background, but that's not their primary purpose. Most of our engineers are doing a lot of civil and uh, engineering type work or mechanical engineering, some electrical engineers, really focused on design and construction. Um, anybody that's gonna have any traffic experience is probably gonna most likely be doing bridge and road design and construction on our installations. So most of the times they just hire a consulting firm uh, to do the traffic engineering work for us. My organization is the only entity within the DOD that does traffic engineering work for the DOD, and I'm not a very large organization. Now, why do we do this? Well, a couple of reasons. 
there are no civil civilian regulations out there in the country that say you have to follow the same traffic laws, rules, guidance, or anything else. Um, it's all up to us. Uh, but we have a ton of military regulations that say we are going to follow civil guidance to the same extent possible. Um, we're going to follow the MUTCD uh, wherever it's the greatest extent possible. Uh, we're going to enforce state traffic laws on our military installations. Uh, so an installation commander or, or a, a deep, uh, Department of Public Works, DPW, or Civil Engineering Squadron, they have to kind of be aware of what the traffic laws in their states are so they can enforce those. We're going to abide by the same civil sector standards. We're going to follow the AASHTO Green Book uh, as much as we possibly can. Uh, we want to be able to do that. An example of the type of regulations you're going to see that enforce this is the Department of Defense Directive 451011. I'm not going to read that, but that's just an example of what, uh, what, why we have to do what we have to do. Uh, it's also the reason why I want to do what I do. The, um, the other reason is consistency. Uh, the two pictures you see right here, the one on the left, that's typical what you're going to see on my installation. You're not too often going to see this heavy equipment transport with an M1 Abrams on it. If you do, you're lucky. Take a photo of it because uh, they're kind of cool. Um, but but the, the vehicle on the left, if, if that's the type of vehicle we're seeing, that's a 240,000 pound piece of equipment. It's about 70 feet long and it's 12 feet wide. If we were designing for that all the time, uh, we're going to have a lot of problems. But we're not. We're seeing the same uh, privately owned vehicles, cars, trucks that you're going to see anywhere else. We get the WB67 commercial trucks coming in off our base. That's, that's exactly what we're seeing. And, and because of our military installation, as I mentioned earlier, it's just like a small town or city. My installation commander is a mayor and the same amount of authority a mayor would want if he wants a stop sign put somewhere, even though the warrants aren't there for it, most likely that stop sign is getting put in. Um, they have a lot of authority, a lot of power. Our security forces is just like a county sheriff's department or in the case of the army, the, the military police, uh, shore patrol, whatever. Um, that's exactly what they do. They're there for law enforcement and that includes traffic uh, enforcement. And then as I mentioned, our civil engineering squadron is just like a, a department of public works. Now, there are some differences, obviously vehicles. Sometimes we have to design four different things, not all the time, but occasionally. Um, you may have to be designing for a striker that's got the up armor on it or a, the palletized loading system, one of those things. So design vehicles, you do have to be aware of those, uh, but it's not the, the, I won't say that's, that's probably 5% of what we have to deal with some of the times. One of the other big issues is funding. Um, we don't have a Department of Transportation in the DOD. Uh, we don't have a transportation department in our county uh, uh, government. We don't have specific funding for transportation and organization. Um, all of our funding gets funneled down from the Department of Defense straight to the installation and their construction dollars have to be used for everything, whether it's building a new barracks facility, uh, it's building a new headquarters for some command or doing roadway work. And I can tell you where road work tends to fall usually, way down the list. Um, about the only time it gets a real high priority is if some two-star general is backed up in traffic too long somewhere or he damages his Corvette getting it off, off the base when he hits a pothole. Um, you're gonna hear some complaints then and very, very quickly. Uh, or if somebody is doing uh, physical training, PT, and they almost get by, hit by a car in a crosswalk, that's where you're gonna start hearing some complaints. So our funding, um, it, there's a lot of classes, I don't wanna get in depth into it, but basically there's really kind of two levels of funding. We have military construction, which is uh, uh, major projects over $3 million, and that actually has to get approval by Congress. And then we have some what's known as minor construction that's more up to the installation. But as I said, we don't get a lot of um, a lot of the priority when it comes to transportation funding. Some of the other things is traffic control. Um, you're not typically going to find signs like these out on a public roadway. Uh, tank crossing, active beer, barrier head, that type of thing. Uh, so we do have to do some supplemental things. We've actually developed a DOD supplement for the MUTCD. Um, that FHWA did not approve, but they did concur that there were no major flaws in it. Um, we have an interesting relationship with Federal Highway Administration on how they look at our installations. Uh, but they did, we do partner with them as much as we possibly can. Now, I'm going to transition slightly to the topic, so I'm going to open it up if there's any questions. All right, don't be afraid to ask. I'll give you my email address later and you can ask me whatever you need to later on. Um, all right, moving on. I'm going to talk, talk about DOD organization, so you feel free to go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> the, this slide, um, it, 
This, this slide is easy to explain at the bottom where I am, and it's easy to explain at the top uh, where the Office of Secretary of Defense is. It bulges out in the middle on two different paths that I kind of got to explain a little bit. Um, the Department of Defense, everybody's familiar with the Dar Department of Defense, our, our Secretary Mattis, our Secretary of the uh, DOD. Um, underneath that, most everybody's familiar with the various service uh, components, the Army, Navy, uh, Marine Corps, uh, Air Force, sometimes the Coast Guard. Uh, th that, that's pretty straightforward. On a day-to-day -day basis, I get paid by the Army. My money comes from them, all our administrative rules flow from them. But my, what I'll call my operational work, the, the mission I do, it gets funneled under what's known as U.S. Transportation Command. U.S. Transportation Command is one of nine combatant commands in the DOD. Uh, there are six of them that are geographical. Some of you are probably familiar with CENTCOM, Central Command, which can, covers the Mideast. Uh, we have a SOUTHCOM, which covers uh, the, the South America and Latin America, NORTHCOM. Each of them have slightly different missions and roles and responsibilities. There are also three functional commands. Uh, there is Global Strike Command, and then there is um, uh, Special Forces Command, uh, SOCOM, in, uh, out of Florida. Uh, they, there is more global coverage, and it's more focused on Special Forces operations, that type of thing. The other one is Transportation Command. Obviously, you can see what our function is. Uh, now, when we're talking transportation, uh, as you probably know, there's a, a vast array of definitions to transportation. Transcom is primarily focused on more of a logistic side of transportation. Uh, do we have enough planes, trains, trucks to get us where we need to go? That type of thing. Do we have enough um, infrastructure in place, uh, in route infrastructure, whether it's a facility, where, uh, what you'd be known as a multimodal or intermodal type facility. So do we have airfields where we can take stuff off trucks, put it on planes? We have rail yards, that type of thing. That's really where they're getting into. They don't get into so much the nitty gritty of, of pavements and bridges and sometimes traffic engineering, um, but that's what we're there. Underneath that, each of the service branches, uh, the Navy, which is the Military Sea Lift Command on the right, the Air Force Air Mobility Command, and then my organization, the Military Surface Deployment Distribution Command, each one of us have different responsibilities. Uh, SDDC is obviously surface, uh, um, and it includes port operations, the Navy um, on the water, and then the Air Force is flying stuff around. Now, underneath that, we have what's known as the Transportation Engineering Agency. Within the transcom world of operations, that's where the bulk of the engineers are. So, future plug, if anybody's looking for work, TEA hires, we have about 100 plus people. We hire probably 50 plus engineers in my organization. Uh, that ranges from mechanical engineers, uh, we have a couple of electricals. We don't talk about them too much, but they're, they're there for a reason. Uh, I, I don't understand what they do. So that, <laughs> that's the only reason I, I, I say that. Um, and then the rest are civil engineers. Underneath uh, the Transportation Engineering Agency, um, our role is to ensure that the, the civil and military transportation infrastructure can um, deploy forces is really what we're looking to do. Can we get from fort to port to the overseas location um, with the least amount of difficulty possible by whatever means necessary? Uh, within our organization, we have uh, modelers and analysts. Um, we have some, uh, the, the term we're using now is ORSAs, uh, Operational Research Systems Analysts. I think that's the phrase for that. Uh, we have a, a, quite a few of those. They're doing our, our physical simulation and modeling. Um, we uh, have uh, transport evaluators. These are the guys that are actually testing uh, equipment to see how it can be loaded on a rail car, a plane, or a boat without damaging that piece of equipment or the, the transport that it's on. Uh, we have some GIS specialists, uh, things like that. Um, the bulk of the engineers and the greatest uh, division to work in there is the Office of the Special Assistant for Transportation Engineering. That's where I work. Our history goes back quite a ways, um, late 40s, early 50s, we were established to support the Chief of Transportation of the, the Army. Uh, since that time, we've branched out and now we serve all service branches. We have six divisions in the Office of Special Assistant for Transportation Engineering. Um, my previous life, I worked for the Highways for National Defense Program. That's right to the left of the yellow box there. Um, that's a, a, uh, the, the responsibility is to ensure that the civil sector transportation, the highway network can serve the needs of the DOD, both in peacetime and wartime. And it's also to make sure that we as a DOD were using uh, our roadways as we should. Um, there are times I found myself being a mechanical engineer in that function. 
uh, knowing the different load configurations of trucks and the axle limits and how loads distributed across axles. Um, I learned so much from a permit officer in Caltrans uh, about loading of, of hydraulic platform trailers than I ever wanted to know in my life. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, we also have a Ports for National Defense program. They coordinate, oh, sorry, Highways for National Defense. A lot of coordination work with state DOTs and Federal Highway Administration. Uh, our Ports for no National Defense program, they work a lot with uh, MARAD under the Department of Transportation and evaluating um, commercial seaports, uh, whether it's the Port of Long Beach, California, um, or several others. Uh, they go out and evaluate those, the infrastructure that's available on those if we have to outload through that port or or redeploy through that port back into the US. Um, they also evaluate a few military seaports that we own in SDDC uh, for ammo outload capabilities. Uh, our railroads for national defense program, uh, they do a lot of coordination with FRA. Uh, they're making sure that we have the rail access to the installations that we need. A lot of the bulk of our, our military equipment goes out of installations, say you're coming out of Fort Bliss um, or um, a Fort Riley, Kansas, just south of us here, a little way south and west. Uh, that's going to go out on a rail car. It's easier, quicker. You don't have a thousand trucks all over the country trying to get to the same location. It's all on a rail car. So they're responsible for making sure that we have that infrastructure in place. Um, I'm going to jump over to our infrastructure branch. Our infrastructure branch goes out. Um, they do a lot of work uh, overseas doing evaluation of airports, uh, aerial ports, and seaports uh, to see if they have the capabilities. And they also look at installations within the U.S. to see what their outload capabilities are. Do they have enough railhead spacing? Do they have ramps to load equipment on? Uh, do they have material handling equipment that they need? Uh, and then finally, our Defense Access Roads Program. Um, though a lot of people don't know, we can't use military construction dollars off our installations. So if we do something on an installation that impacts a roadway outside, uh, for instance, we add 10,000 people to our base, or we close a gate down and open up a new one. There is no mechanism. We can't just walk over to the DOT and say, here's some money, fix this roadway. We have to use what's known as the Defense Access Roads Program. They do a certification um, that determines if we are impacting that roadway. And then we work with Federal Highway Administration to actually um, get the work done, uh, typically. That's the only mechanism where you can spend that money off an installation. Finally is the Traffic Engineering Program. That's who I am. Um, we, uh, I have a small staff, I have three engineers, all graduates of RALA, uh, and uh, an engineering technician and myself. Uh, we do the bulk of our work through, um, through contracting actions, but we are the only entity within the DOD that does traffic engineering work. As I said, there's a couple of, of, of installations that might have somebody working there, but for the most part, that is it. Now, that is a very quick summary of the DOD and the organization that I work for. Um, but that's about as quick as I could and still cover the other material I wanted to in here. Um, the traffic engineering mission. Um, you're going to see something is things in here, improve safety and reduce traffic congestion. I'm sure everybody's heard about that at a, a city or a state or a county or anything else. That's a, one of our primary responsibilities. But we also are trying to control access to our installation, which is kind of a strange thing. But my goal is still to save lives and not damage people, but be able to get, let the warfighter do their job. Within this mission, we have three primary task um, uh, functions that we do. We provide general traffic engineering assistance. This is the, the guy calling me to make sure that he's got the right type of stop sign. Um, does he have his crosswalks in the location? Are they striped properly? That type of thing. Uh, do very qu quick answer type things. Uh, we also produce guidance reference material, uh, educational material and things like that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And we do traffic engineering studies. Now, guidance and materials. Uh, I'm gonna point out all the guidance and materials I'm talking about, such as this lovely pamphlet 5515, which I'll talk about later, um, every one of this is available publicly. If you go out and search for, for pamphlet, uh, that's 558, um, you, you're gonna find it and gain access to it. Two of the big pamphlets we produce is 558, which is, is a very basic tutorial. We like to use the phrase KISS, uh, keep it simple, soldier. Um, so that at the installation level, it would not give them ability to do a full-blown traffic engineering study on their own, but it gives them enough awareness to know what they should be looking for, and if they hire a consulting firm, what kind of products they should be expecting. Uh, the other big pamphlet, and I'll talk more about this later, is 5515. That's our entry control facility pamphlet. It describes what you should be seeing in an entry control facility. 
One of the other pieces of guidance I mentioned, the DOD supplement to the um, uh, MUTCD, which actually we need to go through an update because we've got a few different uh, things in there. This is specific. We have some of our own specific signs in here uh, for the DOD. Um, we follow all the same regulations, retroreflectivity uh, that we can, same dimension, size, colors. Uh, military installations like to use a variety, rainbow of colors for like guidance signs, historic signs, you name it. We've really tried to get away from that as much as possible, make sure they're using the same things. Um, the only variations we get to this is we do work overseas, um, OCONUS operations, and you, sometimes you have to tailor it to the local uh, system that they have. Uh, you may also have to put dual languages on a sign, that type of thing. Uh, the other thing we do is we, we produce uh, traffic engineering seminars, workshops. Uh, my team, about three to four times a year, travels around the country, and we do a three-day traffic engineering seminar. It's just enough to make people at an installation dangerous and make my phone ring a lot because somebody will see something in this seminar and realize they need to get something done, but they don't know the proper avenue to get it done. So, so it, it, it raises level of awareness. Um, those workshops are attended by the complete spectrum of personnel on a base. You'll see security uh, personnel there, uh, military police, safety personnel, uh, installation planners, installation engineers, uh, you name it, they're going to be there and they're going to, the, and it raises a lot of questions. But one of the great things it does is, I'm sure many have heard of the, the 4E concept for traffic safety, crash reduction, you know, enforcement, education, engineering, uh, emergency evacuation. It brings those people together and it realizes that they can't do traffic engineering work without talking to each other. Safety may one have one mission. Security is going to have another. Engineering is going to have an entirely different one. And then there's lawyers that are going to get involved later down the road. So we, we have to bring everybody in together to understand what they're doing. Two other things that we produce is what's known as our smart decision evaluator. That's not available to the public and our better military traffic engineering. The smart decision evaluator is just a very basic tool to be able to tell an installation. You plug in some basic parameters, how many lanes they need to process the traffic they do. Uh, the other one, the BMTE, this is a web-based tutorial and calculator uh, for, for just some common installation engineering questions. Uh, do I have the, the warrants for a traffic signal? It's got four modules to it. You can see those up there. Um, uh, intersection, uh, roadway, roadside safety, parking, entry control facilities. It's a pretty basic tool, but it is useful. It'll tell you, if you how much of a, a merge link do I need behind an ID check station to allow vehicles to get in there? And we follow as... As I said, whether it's Highway Capacity Manual, uh, Green Book, we follow those specs to the greatest extent possible. And if somebody asks me what SMART stands for, I'll try to remember it later on, because I don't know right now. Um, the uh, traffic engineering states, this is the bulk of what I do in my organization. Uh, on an annual basis, we do about 24 delivered contracts. Uh, I have about a one and a half million dollar budget, which is always short of what I need. I get a lot more requests than I need. Uh, that I can do. And we do about 30 in-house studies per year. And an in-house study, I, I say um, that can range anything that takes about a day uh, to I've got an individual, he's getting ready to go to Hawaii for two weeks, rough duty in December. I can tell you that and he's catching flack for that. Um, but uh, to do some eva roadway evaluations, um, that's taken him a, a lot of man hours and he's going to be spending two weeks down there doing road evaluation and meeting with the, the DOT. So these can be rather extensive or they can be as small as anything. We cover the broad range of traffic engineering topics. Um, comprehensive transportation study, this could be as extensive as doing an entire traffic management plan for an installation. Uh, traffic impact studies, we don't do as much of this, uh, BRAC, base realignment and closure um, as we used to, but it, it is not uncommon. If an installation decides to move 5,000 people from off-base facilities to on-base facilities, we have, to, um, we have to be able to address that. Uh, MUTCD requirements, we've done a lot of sign management. When FHWA changed some of their rules on retroreflectivity and things like that about uh, 10, eight years ago, uh, we started getting a lot of calls from those type of things. Uh, over the past year, um, probably the biggest thing we've seen the, the most used of is doing uh, gate studies and assessment, ECFs. ACP stands for Access Control Point. Um, different service branches, it's the same thing. They just use different languages for it. Uh, part of the reason for this change is one of our guiding documents that the Army Corps of Engineers puts out, uh, the Unified Facilities Criteria for Entry Control Facilities had language in there that stated um, before they would fund um, a gate project, 
uh, for major modification or reconstruction, it had to have a traffic study either done by my branch or validated by my branch. So if some, they had somebody else come in and do it, we had to at least look at it to make sure they'd done their, their, the, the proper work. Because uh, what was happening is a lot of installations were coming in and going, I got to build a new gate. I want it to be like 15 lanes wide and, you know, do all this. And you start doing it, it's like, no, you need like two lanes, you know. So, um, so we, we had to, a lot of validation of what they're doing there. Now, I'm going to pause for a second. Oh, this is just an example of some of the type of work we produce. When I say we do traffic studies, um, we're doing what's, what some would know as like feasibility designs, conceptual designs, that type of thing. Is it feasible? You're going to have enough of uh, lanes. Will the traffic flow through this type of layout? We don't get into detailed design. We don't get into environmental work, constraints, anything like that. If an installation tells us there's a hazmat facility at some location, we'll do what, the best we can. But what we're making sure is can we get the turning vehicles we need through here? Can we process the traffic through here? What installations do with this when they get done with it is when I mentioned that funding process, DOD has to do what's a, it's called a DD form 1391. It is a long form that's your justification for getting military construction funding. They use this material to justify getting their funding through the service branch that they work for, through the DOD, and finally through Congress. And that's how they support this a lot of times. All right, I'm gonna pause for questions here because I'm gonna shift gears again. Are you sure? It can be general questions, anything. All right, I'll start asking everybody else questions. How's that? Um, okay. I'm gonna focus on one type of study that we do, entry control facilities. Um, and I'm gonna quote the words of Dr. Roulette from the January 27 Omaha World Herald. In part, this is the only time I'll read directly off the slide. Dr. Roulette said, two goals govern the design of military entrance gates, safe and efficient entry and security. Goals he acknowledged can conflict with each other. So on one side, we're trying to get as many vehicles as possible through an entry control facility and then that one chance out of a thousand that a threat vehicle tries to get on there, we can stop it while not injuring all of those other 999 people. So it's a very conflicting goal. I'm of the opinion that when I started doing this work about a year and a half ago, I tried to find some aspect or entity within the, the civil sector world that compared to an entry control facility. And some would think like, well, a toll plaza on a, on a toll road. Not really. They're designed to collect money and get vehicles through there as quickly as possible. Uh, entrance to like a national park, say Yellowstone or something like that. If somebody runs through their gate without paying, they're not going to try to stop that vehicle because they're not going to worry about, they're going to try to blow up something, you know, down the road. So, so they're not interested in doing that. So this is the actual definition out of UFC 422.01. You can find this online too. And I highlighted, I underlined two things. Secure the installation from unauthorized access, maximizing vehicular traffic flow. It says it right there. Four priorities for an ECF, security, safety, capacity, and sustainability. Um, my function is focused primarily on capacity and safety as well. Safety has two components. Safety of the people on the base uh, so that nobody gets hurt there and as well as safety of the traveling public going on to the base. Uh, there are two documents that guide what we do, um, 5515 on the right, and then the UFC that's produced by the Army Corps of Engineers. It's actually produced by the Protective Design Center, the PDC over in Omaha. Uh, they have a great facility, uh, the, the really intelligent guys. Um, when it comes to doing asp uh, uh, looking at aspects of an entry control facility, such as the specifics of an ABB, an anti-vehicle barrier, uh, the electronics of that and everything else, they're the ones that get into that nitty gritty. I'm more focused on the traffic engineering aspects. So, evolution of an entry control facility. It's kind of what they look like. Now, the bottom picture on the right, yes, that's kind of dated. And actually, I think that's in South Korea, but it, it's very typical of what you're going to see. Fort Stewart on the right, uh, I believe that's Fort Benning on the left. That's about what you'd see. Not much there, not much to stop people. Um, maybe he has a firearm. Uh, they may have some, some rifles, but that's really what you're going to see there. Not a lot of protection. That stop bar there on the left is not going to stop a lot of people. Those chain link fence there at the Fort Stewart picture, picture aren't going to stop a lot of folks. We're now designing stuff like this, canopies. We have commercial truck pull-off inspection areas, visit control parking. Um, we're using things like uh, uh, x-ray of commercial equipment to see what's in them. 
multi-lane facilities, uh, reversible lanes even to some points as necessary. They've dramatically changed. Well, the question is, they've dramatically changed, but what caused that? Uh, one of the biggest ones is September 11, 2001. Though this wasn't a direct attack on a military installation, it opened a ton of eyes to our anti-terrorism force protection issues on our installations. There were a couple other incidents, the, the Cobar Tower bombings in, um, in Kuwait, uh, even the Oklahoma City bombing to a little bit. But for the most part, prior to September 11th, our bases were open. You only needed that vehicle decal in the top picture to get onto a base. They looked at it, waved. If you've got the cool little uh, eagle on the side there, they saluted you as your car drove by. That was it. Very rarely did they be vehicle searches. We had very few uh, ATFB, anti-terrorism force protection measures on our installation. Afterwards, uh, everybody said, uh-oh. So at the very minimum now on our installations, you gotta have an ID card. The driver alone, sometimes they're doing full. Uh, that's what the random access measures. They may be checking everybody's ID in the card. We're implementing systems like DBITS. That's the Defense Biometric Identification Database System. Uh, this is an, an online system. They scan my ID card. It shows whether I'm authorized to be on and off that base or not. If it doesn't match up, they're not letting me on. Uh, we have uh, ABBs, anti-vehicle barriers now at our installations. We're doing uh, VACA systems, commercial x-ray systems. Um, all those things are big changes. One of the other changes is housing changes. Now you think, what does that have to do? Well, prior to about the mid-90s, many of our people lived on bases. So they had no need to go in and out of an entry control facility. School was right there. They did all their shopping there. They did everything there. Well, the military changed how they looked at housing and many people started living off base because they've got the money to do it. So they're buying more homes. Uh, there's some data that can show this. Um, we have uh, higher marriage rates at lower levels than we used to, uh, lower rank levels than we used to in the military. Uh, more people have families at lower rank, ranks. Uh, more people are buying homes in the military compared to the civil sector at same age brackets. So all this is occurring off base. Well, all those people have to get on base and that's how they're doing it. Uh, some people would say there's a few other changes that have occurred in our installation. We're using more civilians and contractors and few of active duty. I don't really agree with that because um, the numbers don't really back that up, but that, that's what people will talk about. So I don't want to argue with them too much. So what was the impact? It's pretty obvious when they start making all these instant changes, traffic starts backing up badly. And, and I can tell you that it does not take very long for a colonel or general to be sitting in traffic to go, something's got to change, fix it now. And so you're scrambling. So we had a lot of traffic backup in our installations. Well, let's back up and talk about what the functions of an entry control facility are. You kind of saw the definition. Uh, there's a few basic functions for an entry control facility. Uh, throughout the entire zone, We've got speed management. We're trying to reduce, slow traffic down, um, whether that's general traffic, uh, threat vehicles, uh, through the entire area past the final barrier. You have an approach and a queue zone. Queue zone stacking up traffic just like you'd see anywhere else. At multiple locations, you have to what's known as denial exit lanes, uh, rejection lanes, so they can get in the outbound lanes and go out. You have decision points where if they're normal to the base and they have a right to be there, they're going to proceed straight to the gatehouse ID check station. They may have to go to the visitor center and get approval, uh, a, a pass to get on the base. Um, at that point, they can be rejected, passed through the ID check stand. They could be sent to a POV inspection lane. Uh, once they go through the gatehouse, they may be pulled over to do a separate vehicle inspection. They may be rejected. Who knows? And then all through this entire area, you have the overwatch that's watching over it um, to, to make sure everything is, is operating properly, watching for threats, watching over the ID checkers, make sure there's no issues. And then you have the final barrier, which is our AVB. And all of this is going to be contained with some type of passive barrier so that nobody can break through just a chain link fence and get somewhere on the base. Uh, the only thing you're not going to see functional in this photo is uh, there's occasion, pardon me, you're going to see a commercial vehicle pull off a commercial vehicle parking area for inspections of those. Um, some installations break those out. Some, some, depending on the type of traffic you have coming in and out, they may have their own or they may just be part of it. So going back to my base, it's got Air Force Base. This is Shiloh Gate. It's got Air Force Base. You can see all the features I was talking about. Uh, we got our approach queue zone. There's a visitor center right there in the mid middle. Um, the gate is just off to the left of the, uh, the, the sorry, the gate, the fence line. It's just off to the left of the screen there. Um, we have rejection lanes throughout the entire area. You have the gatehouse ID check station, pull off inspections, rejection lanes, overwatch, and then our ABB is down on the final uh, location there. So we have all those functions. That's what you're going to see. 
the, the entry control facility is broken up into, it's three zones, they, they show four on here. One's a safety zone, that's just outside the, in the entry control facility. But we're focused on the approach zone, the access control zone, and the response zone. Um, the access control zone is, is where we're processing to make sure you have a right to be on there. The approach zones, we're trying to control vehicles, give them decision points, give them enough information so that they know where they're supposed to go. Is it a commercial truck it's supposed to be going here? Is it a, a POV, a privately owned auto, a vehicle going here? You name it. And then the response zone, if somebody gets past us, a threat vehicle, um, do we have the, the space to respond to what we need to? And outside of that safety zone, we have known what's known as standoff barriers. You don't want inhabited buildings so close to the ID check station because of a threat vehicle, uh, a vehicle borne IED or something like that pulls into there. You don't want to damage anything outside of that area except for that, that area. This is just a sample from the 5515 of, of what kind of the conceptual design will look like. This actually has vehicle processing. You can see all the various functions there. Now, questions? Pause point. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do actually for traffic engineering. We do an entry control facility study. Okay, good. Um, when we do an entry control facility study, the, the basic thing, the, the only real true thing that we have to do is we have to calculate do they have enough lanes to get um, all the people processed through the bay. We're, we're, we're working on a level of service D type concept, which means about 120 seconds of delay during the peak hour. Um, do we have enough lanes to do that? That's a very basic thing, but we would be remiss if that's all we did because I can process all the vehicles in the world through that gate right there, but if they get down to the first adjacent intersection and it's not capable of handling all that traffic, um, it's gonna cause problem. If it's the first in external adjacent intersection and we're dumping a bunch of traffic on the locals, that's not, that's not right either. So we, we evaluate from the first adjacent external and internal intersections through the entire area and that's what we look at. Now, Areas and concern. Um, as I said, all this material you're going to see right through here comes out of my 5515, so I stole a lot of that. Uh, we look at a lot of different areas. Uh, we're concerned about crash history. We're concerned about the operation and manpower. And operation and manpower plays a huge role because how quickly they can scan an ID card, look at an ID card, and get you through the base really determines your throughput capacity. We're looking at the security. Um, guard safety, I mentioned safety earlier. We're talking guard safety and roadway safety. Roadway safety, I already talked about a little bit. Guard safety, we're concerned about, is this guard protected if somebody, errant driver comes through there? And errant drivers do occur. Um, we've had uh, drunk drivers come in our installation. Uh, we have one facility that was very close to a toll road and everybody thought it was a toll plaza. So they would throw chains at the guard and drive through. Uh, so it happens. <laughs> um, yes, it does. We, we had some of the strangest things out there. Um, the, um, so we have to look at that. Uh, we look at all of these things. Uh, we, we have to talk about accessibility development. Some of our installations have high pedestrian and bicycle traffic coming to those. Uh, surpri not surprising, military likes to stay fit. They run and jog and bicycle a lot. Uh, so we have to accommodate that. Uh, sustainability, a little bit, we don't get as much into that. That's generally, uh, but we do talk about it a little bit. Um, we, we have to consider future development, just like you're not going to design a roadway without considering the 20-year long-term picture. We have to do that in our installation. Is there a base realignment and closure coming down the line in the next, I don't know, 10 years that we have to consider that's going to introduce a lot of traffic in on our base? Um, we also have to consider a few other things. So these are some of the areas of concern. Um, we have an evaluation checklist and we go out and we look at all of these different things. Uh, the thing on the right is actually a document that we produce. We put it in our reports. It shows um, we evaluate it compared to the UFC in our 5515 and we tell them what the existing status was. Um, we don't get super in-depth into to certain things like pavement design and things like that. You know, we're not, do they have a gatehouse? We don't care what kind. We're going to be looking at those things, but we dig into these things to see if they do or don't have those to give them the most accurate picture of what's going on um, at their organization possible. Now, when we're doing an ECF, I, I like to talk about the entire thing, but as I said, that's an entire day class during our seminar. So I'm gonna focus on a couple of the big areas that we, we hit. Um, geometric design, I talked about that a little bit. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much in depth beyond this, but uh, we have to design. Can we turn a WB67 around that happens to get to that gate point and they're not supposed to be going through there? Do we have the turning radius to get them out of there? Um, do we have the proper merge length? Um, anybody that's driven through a toll plaza, I'm sure everybody has, it's a free for all when you leave the toll plaza. 
Uh, military installation is very much the same. Um, we, we operate almost in the same philosophy. Everybody's nice, but we all merge together. But we gotta have at least a proper length on that. Um, the uh, other things we look at is proper signing. Um, in an entry control facility, we, we wanna make sure we have the right signs to educate the, the, and tell people what's going on, but we don't have too much. We don't want sign clutter in there. The last thing I wanna do is distract a driver's eyes from what he should be focusing on, which is slowing down, getting his ID ready, and, and he should already have that out of his pocket, um, and where the, the ID checker that they're going to. If they have to make decisions I, any more than necessary, I don't want them doing that. The other thing is proper size. Do we have the right number of ID check lanes? Do we have queue storage? Do we have truck queue storage? Are we in a facility where we have a lot of bikes and pedestrians? Do we have to design for that? Uh, the other thing is proper placement. Are we putting the final barrier at the proper place? I'm gonna talk a little bit more on that, but there's two aspects to talking about proper placement. Do we have it far enough away to be able to contain a threat vehicle? Uh, and is also placed properly so that nobody's gonna hit it inappropriately or anything like that. And throughout all this, we're focused on safety as well, protecting it. Uh, we don't want anybody hitting blunt ends or anything like that, that, that happens. Yes, drunk drivers are doing something illegal, but I don't wanna kill a drunk driver just because they happen to come onto my base. Um, I'm gonna focus on sizing of ID check lanes. We'll talk about a little bit about barrier placement. Sizing, uh, starts with data collection. Everybody knows this, you do data collection. We look at lane processing, how quickly they're processing uh, vehicles through there. And we also look at the type of processing they're doing. Are they just looking at an ID check card and comparing it to you? Are they using some handheld scan system like DBIDs? Are they using some automated entry system where you just hold your card up to it and it opens up a gate? All of those things affect uh, the processing time. We look at the number of ID checkers that they're using per lane. Um, you rarely see more than four, uh, but uh, we, we do look at those type of things. And you do see a declining rate of return on the number of ID checkers per lane that you add there. We look at force protection conditions. Very, that's the rainbow chart on the right there. Um, I keep pointing, I hope everybody can see where I'm pointing to. Um, the, you're rarely gonna see less than Bravo. Um, it, normal and alpha, uh, you don't really see that anymore. Bravo with various random measures. If we get to Delta, traffic is not getting it on and off the base. I can tell you that right now. We typically design for Bravo. Uh, that's what, what we're looking at. Um, we do Q measurements as well. It's, it's, not, it's not enough to analyze, are we processing enough traffic? How are we backing up traffic? Because uh, we're really interested in the demand, traffic demand, not necessarily what they can do. Uh, that's the type of things we're looking for sizing. Um, when we're doing data collection, we, as I mentioned, we also have to consider factors that are not showing up in there. Same, just like you would in the civil sector world, is school in, school out? Is it summertime, is it wintertime? That type of thing. And our bases we're looking at, if we got an, uh, a unit that's on major deployment, maybe you've got a, a thousand soldiers overseas and are not coming in off that base. Um, that's the type of thing we have to look at. We have to look at what the future is. They're planning there. Are they planning to move a large facility from one side of the base to another that's gonna impact an entry control facility? Are they a base that does a lot of visitors, say a, a basic training facility like Fort Leonard would, and they have graduation. So you have one day up every other month, you've got a large number of visitors coming on that base. How are you gonna deal with them? Uh, that type of thing. So we have to consider all of these factors in our data collection. Um, and, and part of this, uh, we don't get as much of this, and I, I don't want to exclude this, but is also an awareness of what's occurring outside the base. Installations, you, you may not believe this, but installations don't always communicate with the outside individuals very well. Uh, they don't talk to their DOTs, their county engineers, or anything like that. So they may not know what's going on out there. But if, if the, the county or the state is planning on doing a major roadway project outside of our entry control facility and we don't know about it that can have huge impacts on our entry control facility it may dump a bunch more traffic on our ecf than what we plan for uh, so we have to consider those things sometimes that's just doing some google searches of the dot and finding out what you can so when we get these numbers we just do a basic lane calculation our, our smart evaluator tells us what to do uh, it'll do this automatically for you but that's pretty straightforward. The hard part is the data collection. But once we get that, uh, we take into account deployment adjustments, um, processing rate. Um, in this case, our processing, we're, we're basing it off one ID checker per lane uh, for four vehicles, and, and that's how you get to it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but uh, that's, the, as I said, the bulk of the work is up front. So that's how we get to that. As I mentioned earlier, a couple of things. We designed for Force Protection Bravo. Uh, that's about the standard. We designed for a level of service D, and we defined that. Um, installations will vary this. We'll tell them, well, you need five lanes. Well, they're gonna ask, can I do three? 
So one of the things we have to be able to tell them, as I told you, the declining rate of return on number of ID checkers is we, if you go to three and use this many, you're only gonna be able to process miss as many and this is how much you have to back up. So the same thing that you would have to tell your mayor, your governor, whoever it is, okay, if you do this, this is the impact to it. You have to be aware of that. Um, moving on. Uh, the other aspect to it, one of the big aspects we do is the, the placement of equipment and materials. So they don't hurt anybody or anything else. One of the biggest things is making sure our ABB is placed in the proper location. Um, when we're dealing with entry control facilities, we deal with four kinds of threats. First threat is just a vehicle that's approaching at a high rate of speed and he continues at a high rate of speed through the ID check station and just blows through it. The so second one is slowly approaching it and at some point before he gets there, he just accelerates, it punches through and drives on. The third is he gets to the ID check and then he hits it and he takes off. The fourth one is somebody that's been rejected and instead of turning around, he takes off. Each one of these has their own aspects. All of them have different initial speeds, um, different starting points. So we have to calculate for those things. So when we're calculating the placement, um, we have to determine the threat vehicle speed. What's its initial speed? Uh, what did it start with? We use an acceleration rate and we determine how far away our ABB has to be from the ID check station. Now, for theoretical purposes, it'll never exceed 130 miles per hour. Um, you have to set some point and that's where we start at. The timing that we base that upon is uh, we use three seconds. That's the time it takes for a guard to see that a vehicle is a threat and to hit his emergency function operation button to deploy the barriers. Um, it takes a barrier, we average about two seconds for that barrier to deploy. And then we have a certain number of seconds depending on the type of safety scheme that we're using to allow clearance for innocent vehicles. So they can get out of the way. We don't want grandma driving to the BX at 25 miles per hour and all of a sudden a barrier goes up in front of her and she hits it. Um, we don't want that to happen. So we have to account for that. Worst case scenario that we calculate is nine seconds uh, of time, uh, four seconds of clearance, and then the three and two. Uh, we have some that are as low as five seconds to involve, and I'll talk about that in a second. As I said, we don't want to injure the innocent driver. Uh, for example, just when I mention AVBs, the type of thing that we're looking at, I threw some examples up here. Uh, the one on the top is a wedge barrier that's flush with the pavement during normal times. It pops up, you hit it. It can be very dangerous. Uh, one we're seeing more often is the two other pictures that's called a net barrier. They like those in northern regions because all the equipment's above ground. You don't have hydraulics. You don't have to worry about ice or snow or salt damaging it. One of the things I like about this, this is less damaging to an innocent driver. Um, we've had an incident where um, a, a woman was driving, I think she hit it about 50 miles per hour down to Fort Benning, Georgia. She walked away, her vehicle is drivable after. But that will stop a threat vehicle. So um, that's one of the ones I'm, I'm kind of in favor of. But now when we do put these up, one of the things, I'll, I'll point out something here. Um, we have to make sure that these are marked properly. Uh, if that wasn't marked, all you're going to see is a dark blob at nighttime if you come up on it. So we have to make sure that we have the, the proper striping and marking on these things. And we have signs and signals, and I'll talk about that in just a second, uh, the warnings that we have. Worst case theoretical situation you're going to have, if you have a completely tangent section, um, you're going to have a, a, the longest zone from the ID check station to the ABB is about 1,600 feet. Um, unfortunately, that's infeasible in a lot of locations. Urban areas, you just don't have that space. Um, you, you do not have it. We in our organization have a couple of basic uh, guidance materials uh, for installations to understand what kind of schemes that they want to set up. Uh, we call them safety schemes. So these are just basic structures. It shows them where they should have their signing, where certain things should be established, where they should be putting their loops and things like that. And then what, depending on what they're using uh, for signs and signals. This is called our conventional signs and signals setup. Uh, you can see the signing that's through there. We've got the warning signing, uh, yellow all warning. We have uh, detection loops. Um, this type of setup is based upon a nine second clearance time. We allow them four seconds of yellow, um, three seconds of yellow, sorry, and one of red uh, before the barrier starts going up. That gives adequate amount of time. That has to be lengthened if you're planning for a larger design speed than 25 miles per hour. So if your average driver is gonna be driving more than that, you have to lengthen that time. Um, we typically don't do that because it just makes it longer. Um, this type of configuration is going to do one of two, have one of two types of signal setups. The traditional signal in the bottom right, uh, most times that's just going to be green. It's going to be green all the time and it'll work just like a traffic signal. Um, if it's very closely adjacent to a signalized intersection, we'll make them go all dark on that. Can anybody tell me a problem with going with a conventional traffic signal? 
What do you all do when you see a yellow light at an intersection? Most times you're hitting the gas. Um, we've had that almost happen. Uh, uh, Fort Carson, uh, Colorado Springs, the Air Force Academy, um, people, that's exactly what they're doing. So we're trying to figure out how to deal with that situation. Um, so what we're going to more often than not is this hybrid beacon signal, signal uh, on the right there that's dark all the time, it flashes and then it starts flashing red. That's not something you're typically going to see unless you're at like a, a fire department entrance or, or some location like that. So we're moving towards using those. Uh, it's, just, um, it, it's just a different awareness. Uh, we wanna make people paying attention uh, to what's going on. The other thing that goes along with this is there's usually an audible horn uh, it's about 100 decibels, I think, when this goes off, so it kind of scares people and lets people know what's going on. Another basic one, I apologize for being black and white. Uh, we're going to be updating our 5515 as we be coming out in color. This is called a stop control scheme. Um, it's basically a stop sign. You pull up to it, you stop. Um, if the barrier is not up, you take off. Uh, we don't like putting these in in new construction or major modifications. Uh, they don't process as much traffic. And can anybody tell me the problem with having a stop sign in the middle of nowhere? you stop stopping at it after a while. And the last thing we want is somebody rolling through a stop sign and a barrier starts coming up. And we don't want that to happen. Uh, so we don't recommend using these. And they don't process, uh, I believe that the wording's kind of hard there to read, but if it exceeds about 800 vehicles per hour, you don't want to be using this. You're not going to be able to get through much through there. We have also uh, recently developed what's known as our high efficiency present detection system. Um, the, this involves uh, much longer detection loops. Um, it can involve a, a gate arm uh, farther away from the barrier. We are in the process of looking at combining this with our conventional signs and, and, and signals. So we have a longer detection loop and we're thinking we can reduce our clearance time by just a little bit. This configuration right here is set up to operate in under seven seconds. You only get seven seconds of yellow time because we have the longer loops. Um, if a vehicle is detected on the loop, the barrier doesn't go up. Uh, the thought process is on that is that vehicle now acts as the final denial barrier for a threat vehicle coming through there. Uh, so until it's clear, um, if it doesn't clear at all, vehicle just stops onto the barrier, just stays there and the vehicle acts as the barrier. One of the advantages to this over the conventional signs and signal is in low traffic time frames in the middle of the night, you can operate with the barrier up. So the gate's down, they pull up to it, the detection says, hey, there's somebody here, barrier goes down, the gate goes up and they go through. Uh, if it's a very high um, uh, platooning of vehicles, if they're one right after the other, the barrier just stays down, the gate stays down. As I said, we're looking at using this uh, and modifying our other scheme a little bit to, to go along with this. Um, some of our biggest issues I see in entry control facilities, and even on our installation, and I'm sure nobody's ever seen this, uh, speed reduction, traffic calming in residential areas. You build this roadway that's 40 feet wide and traffic's driving 40 miles an hour. Well, we have the same thing in our installations. Uh, in our residential areas, we're wanting to slow people down, and we also have it in our entry control facilities. Um, ID checker sees a vehicle, they perceive it traveling much faster than what it is, so they want to slow that down. So we, we start introducing different things uh, for traffic calming, and I'll talk about some of the ways we're dealing with that. Now, the other issue is improper usage. Uh, we put stop signs up where we're, we probably shouldn't. Uh, we're putting barriers in the roadway in places they probably shouldn't be, and that's just something you deal with at times. Um, an installation commander is, is the all-powerful one on an installation. If they really, really want something there, there's not much I can do about it. They do a risk assessment. The lawyers tell them why it's not a good or a good idea, is a bad idea. And that's really all we can do. Um, we just try to advise them as much as possible. One of the ones I just recently run into is we try to limit the number of signs in our entry control facility. And the guidance says, you, you know, you're not supposed to have that. Well, an installation commander... They like to post up signs, well, this is, you know, national whatever month or whatever week, or we've got this carnival coming up. Well, can we put those type of signs? It's only for a week. Can we put those in our entry control facility? I'm like, no, no, you don't want to do that. It's a bad idea. And so you got to kind of explain to them why that's a bad idea. The other one is a, is a cost and space footprint. If you have a response on the 1600 feet, you think about the amount of pavement and you've got a number ID check lanes, they're this much, uh, you know, five, that's a lot of pavement, personnel, everything else. So our footprint is huge. Part of the work we've done through the UNL over the past, I guess it's four or five years now, is one was one of the biggest ones is how can we reduce our footprint? We're gonna put these large curved roadways in there that's taking up a lot of space. Um, how can we address that? One of the biggest things that, that has helped come out of this RD18 is our use of passive barrier. That goes all the way around that entire entry control facility. Prior to this, installations were just specking something out, 
and then we're getting a lot of proprietary items and they were costly. I mean, to the tune of like $250 per linear foot. And that's not including the, the, the end terminals. Do the research with uh, UNL um, using a modified Midwest guardrail system. We've managed to come out with a design that's non-proprietary and it's reduced our cost by probably about as much as 50%, which can be significant uh, on an installation. Um, some of the other areas we've looked into is, is how can we have tighter curves. Um, in the past, we were using very strict ASHTO geometric guidance um, and we determined it just wasn't totally applicable at our facility. So how can we tighten things up? Traffic calming. Talk about that a little bit. And I, I say traffic calming, what I really mean is speed reduction. Um, and I hate that because traffic calming has a specific definition. Uh, but speed reduction is really what we're looking at. And that's speed reduction of the everyday driver and also speed reduction of the threat vehicle. Uh, two totally different things uh, sometimes get merged together. We use various vertical deflection methods, speed humps. Uh, speed bumps are prohibited in entry control facilities. Uh, we don't like to use those, um, things like that. You, you see all the same, raised crosswalks, raised intersections, that type of things. Um, and then we also use horizontal deflection methods, permanent curvatures, roundabouts. Uh, we do some retrofit chicane, uh, both permanent and temporary designs, and I'll talk about that as well. Through our experience, most times we determine that horizontal deflection has a greater impact on speed reduction than vertical deflection does. A speed hump will slow traffic down at that point in time, um, but generally it increases speeds in between the speed humps and it, it doesn't do a whole lot for us unless you're putting a whole succession of them. And then you get, as I said, Colonel Johnson is complaining that his Corvette just dragged over a speed hump. So you gotta deal with that. So we, we're typically gonna look at when we can putting horizontal deflection. I talked about speed humps. Uh, we just follow a typical Seminole Watts pro profile. Uh, it's usually not very high. These are very effective for the everyday driver at that location. Testing through UNL has determined that it has no impact on a threat vehicle. I forgot the top speed that we sent a threat vehicle. Is it 60? It's going faster than 60 miles per hour. And it did very little uh, for that threat vehicle. Apparently the, the driver did not want to go much faster than over that. But so really all that does when you put this in an entry control facility is just warns you that, hey, there's somebody driving far faster than they threw him. Um, so now we're doing some other things using these speed humps, putting them in, in some curvature, um, uh, roadway curvature, chicanes, whatever else, to see if there's some way to work that. Um, the, the evidence leads that putting a series of speed humps through a curve has the best impact if they're put in the proper location. A single one may not have the most uh, impact that we would like to see. Horizontal deflection. Um, the other um, type of thing we go with is roadway curvature. We put roundabouts in, put tight curves in, we put chicanes. And this, that picture right there is actually Tinker Air Force Base. It's the Liberator Gate um, at, in Oklahoma. It's actually what they've had in there. Um, they've had some effect to it. I think their top speed they're getting out of that is maybe 20 miles per hour if somebody's really, really good. Uh, but that's about what they're getting. We put roundabouts in a lot of locations as well too, particularly if there's an intersection uh, close to an entry control facility, we'll dump those things in there. One of the biggest problems I face is chicanes, and I'll call these temporary chicanes or movable chicanes. Uh, what these are is uh, Scott Air Force Base, for instance. You will normally have a two-lane roadway going into this entry control facility. During non-peak hours, they want to make it one lane to slow traffic down, so they introduce this weaving chicane design. Those yellow bollards you see popping up out of the roadway there are what they use. Those will lower down in the ground or they can pick them up and move them out of the way. Um, some installations use Jersey barriers and some more permanent chicanes. Um, I don't like using these things. Uh, that, that chicane, if somebody hits that at 50 miles per hour, there's going to be some danger to that. We do have some guidance in our pamphlet. Um, they're not prohibited. We have some guidance about how to properly cone and mark those. You can see that nobody's putting cones or striping or anything out there. Um, we would like to try to find some different designs, uh, definitely not Jersey barriers. One of the things that our research has shown that a, a method instead of Jersey barriers, if you want a more permanent chicane design like that, but you want to be able to stop a threat vehicle, so we've determined that an eight inch curb. An eight inch curb will stop a threat vehicle at most speeds, but it's still mountable by a truck. Um, and if a car hits it, it's not going to injure the driver. If somebody hits that uh, Jersey barrier at 50 miles an hour, it's going to be pretty ugly. The bollards, um, that's an area of research that we probably have down the road of a different way to go. Um, there really isn't much that you can move quickly and easily in and out of the roadway to create a chicane. Um, there, the Air Force is testing some swing gates 
Uh, the swing gates really, um, they may stop just a normal driver. They're not going to stop a threat vehicle. The best they will give you is a, um, is kind of an early warning that you're about to hit something. Um, one of the things our chicane design, the, the uh, testing did here uh, through a couple of different phases, we found out our chicane design was a little liberal. It was too spread out. Threat vehicles could go through it a lot faster than we thought they could. Now, our, the driver of the threat vehicle was also a former race car driver, but it wouldn't take much to be able to, uh, to, to com test that and accommodate that. So we are looking at one is, is you either have to put another chicane, another set of ballers in to create one more chicane, or you have to tighten it up. The problem with tightening it up is then we can't get design vehicles through there. Um, I'm going to throw out a couple of examples of, of the type of designs we've come up with. Um, I know of only one of these that's been put in place so far. As I mentioned, funding. Um, if I do a study today and I produce a conceptual design like this, um, by the time an installation gets it on their books and it has to go through the entire process, you're probably talking five to six years before they'd actually start construction. It's just how long it can take. It's unfortunate. Um, we, we, when we do a study in our installation, this is the ultimate design that we would show them. We also try to provide them with some, um, I'm running a little long, I apologize. Uh, the, uh, we try to show there's some interim fixes that they can do. What we want to do is the minimum they need to meet the, the standard requirements in the UFC, and this would be the, the best concept that they could come up with. Uh, this was a design of a Keyser Air for Space we threw out. You can see the curvature, the spacing we have. Uh, it's not uncommon if we have a, um, the, this, you're going onto the base to the north here. You'll notice we put the curvature in here uh, to allow them to slow down before they got to the, the vehicle barrier. Um, this is Redstone Arsenal in Alabama, outside Huntsville, Alabama, one of our larger facilities. And this one actually did get constructed. Uh, it's a very massive facility that they have there. Um, uh, this one was implemented almost very closely to what this looks like right here. Uh, Fort Eustis, Fort Eustis, Virginia. Oh, sorry, Fort Bliss, Texas. I can't read my own writing. Uh, just another basic design that we put out there. We will show them the types of signs that they should have in different locations, the basic striping they should have. As I said, these are all conceptual drawings, but it talks about where they should have, what they should have. Okay, I'm gonna conclude. Traffic engineering on our installation for the most part is the same as it is anywhere else. Um, we're dealing with the same issues that you're gonna do. We do have some unique facilities. Entry control facilities is probably one of our big ones. Uh, selfish plug, uh, anybody looking for careers outside the world. One, the Air National Guard, the Air Force the, the, is a Beautiful way to make some extra cash down the road, travel and see some pretty cool parts of the, the world and the country. A um, couple of things on that. Air Force and the Navy, you have to be a degreed engineer to be a civil engineering officer, an engineering officer. Um, doesn't matter what the degree field, it could be mechanical, electrical, whatever else. Army, uh, Marine Corps, to be an engineering officer necessarily you don't have to be an engineer. You could be a combat engineer and you're blowing up things. They don't want you to know how to build things too well. Um, so uh, when you're looking at that, in the civil sector side, I tried to get a handle on how many engineers are hired by the DOD, and I, I couldn't even finish it. Um, in my organization alone, we have about 50 engineers out of 100 people. There are other organizations, uh, Army Corps of Engineers. If people don't know, the Army Corps of Engineers has two sides. They have a civil sector side that deals with the lakes and the, the rivers and the locks you see out here. And then they have a military side that's responsible for design and construction on installations. Um, right over here in Omaha, you have the Protective Design Center. Uh, they also have a function down in Vicksburg, Virginia called the uh, ERDIC, the Engineering Research Development Center. Uh, they blow things up down there. It's kind of cool. Um, some of the stuff that they've, they've done there. Uh, they did a lot of work after, I want to say after 2001, on explosive work with bridge structures and things like that. So they, they've done uh, quite a bit of work down there. Um, there are a lot of other entities. Air Force Civil Engineering Center is the one that's kind of the, the home base for civil engineers in the Air Force headed up in, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, the Navy Facility Command is out of, I think it's out of Norfolk, uh, don't correct me if I'm wrong, maybe out of the Navy Yard in D.C. A lot of engineers is where. So the DOD has an extensive uh, uh, amount of engineering available, and not just civil engineers. Uh, we hire electricals, mechanicals, um, uh, you name it, structurals, uh, they're all over the place. So like I said, a little bit of a selfish plug. And on that, some of your students, Army does a couple of different intern programs. Uh, we have a long-term intern program. It's about two years. It usually guarantees you a job once you get out of there because you're already sitting in a slot. And then we do what's known as, uh, I'll call them summer hires, uh, college interns. Actually, we're looking for one that's got Air Force Base. So if anybody wants to commute, that's all I'm saying. 
Um, <laughs> it's a little bit, but uh, it, what that is, is you work the hours during the school year that you can. Uh, in the summertime, if you're not going to classes, you can work 40 hours a week. You get paid at a GS4, uh, GS4 position. Does not guarantee you a job when you graduate, but it does line you up that you've got that experience. And I never realized, I went to school a few years ago. Um, I did not realize how important internships are. Um, I have a daughter, she's a sophomore in college right now, and no, she's not an engineer. I, I tried to get her to do that. Um, some field called economics, I don't even know about that. <laughs> so, so uh, but it's amazing the internship opportunities. There's a lot of them out there. Um, I'm not sure if the PDC hires too many over. Uh, you can just search for Army intern, college internship opportunities. It's, it's a very good learning opportunity. You get to see some interesting things. It's not the old world of interns just filing papers, uh, things like that. Um, but that's all I got. Is there any questions? Do a lot of them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Through a lot of them. Yes, ma'am. If a crash occurs or you have like a ABB activation, do you guys do like an evaluation afterward to? If we, okay, um, this is a, a little inside dirty laundry here. The DOD is horrible about tracking crash statistics. Each service branch has their own little safety area and they're tracking crash statistics, uh, but they're most focused upon things like DUIs and stuff like that. They don't get so much in the injury. Now, if an organization comes to us because they've had a crash or I become aware of it, um, yes, we will investigate and look into that. Um, generally, we try to do, um, anybody familiar with a road safety audit is, road safety assessment? We try to use the exact same approach. We bring in the safety and the security folks. What happened here? What was wrong? Much like any other place, everybody always has an answer of what happened. I need more of this here. I need more of that. There. Well, let's back up and see what the problem is. So yes, we do. Um, AVB problems, um, that is an area where we do need more data collection. The problem is the only way to do it now is to contact installations directly. And that you know, could be thousands of installations go, did you try to deploy it? Because they test these things frequently to see if they work. Well, did you have incidents? Most time it's word of mouth that I hear about it. Um, or they contact the PDC in Omaha and say, hey, we've had an issue here. So they come to us and go, hey, somebody almost did this. How do we address that situation? So we do look at that. Um, usually, um, like my queue list of studies is longer than I have money for. Um, if a crash issue comes up, that's going to be one of the first things we, we pop up with. We take that very, very seriously. So yes, we do. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Oh, in the back? Sorry. Uh, no. So, okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I thought I saw a hand raised. As you're designing these ECPs, are there any... Uh, I would say outstanding needs or things in your toolbox uh, in the pamphlets that aren't serving their purpose that you wish existed to better lay out and design the ECPs? Yes. Um, well, one I mentioned like the temporary chicane design, a, a way to create that so it can be easily set up um, to tear threat vehicles. I'm not really sure where that's at. Um, uh, better ways to using technology to detect threat vehicles. We do do some technology. Um, if somebody's coming in the outbound lanes the wrong direction, we have technology that. We have overspeed detection. If somebody's traveling much faster than they should be. I'm sure there's a lot of other ways to, for technology to, to demonstrate to us uh, that this is a potential threat vehicle. I'm not sure where those are. Real-time data collection would be phenomenal. Um, we, we try to collect as much data, so like talking about processing. If we had a, a much better way to collect more than just a spot check of data throughout the entire year, and yes, I know there's permanent ATRs and things like that, um, but that doesn't really help us so much with you know um, uh, security forces doing ID checks. So real-time data collection is probably a big one. Um, traffic safety collection, oh, gosh, I would we did a better job on that. Coming from FHWA, it's all about the data collection. It's all about safety, anticipating, I won't say anticipating crashes, anticipating locations that have potential for crashes. Um, we, we don't do a very good job of that. I wish we could, um, but I don't, I don't see that right now. But beyond that, that's, in the future, we're gonna have to start dealing with automated vehicles. Um, the DOD is already testing uh, um, unmanned convoy operations. Uh, we've got autonomous vehicles that are being tested out there. Eventually, we're gonna have to deal with that through entry control facilities. The problem is we don't have the money to build what we need now. So I don't know how we're gonna deal with that down the road. Um, 
beyond that, uh, there probably are. It's just I've, I've got smaller things I'm trying to to deal with right now. I'm trying to get people to be consistent in their entry control facility construction. And that's hard enough right now. Not put things in that they're not supposed to. I, I talked about speed humps, not deterring threat vehicles. My very installation within the past year put speed humps at the entry control facility. Um, one of my uh, supervisors up the chain goes, so what do you think of those? I'm like, yeah, they're, they look nice. They're not going to do what you want them to do, but okay. Uh, and so, so you when you have to tell somebody that, they're, they're, um, they just kind of shake their head. So um, that's, that's the issue that I'm probably dealing with more than anything. One more. And if you need to leave, feel free. I'm not going to. How, how, which, which group would be responsible? Would it be your team, your, your uh, I guess, agency that deals with the risks and risk assessment of threat entry around these facilities away from the ECPs? Uh, and the, the reason I asked that, there's some of the bases nearby here, and then it wasn't that many years ago, a new. I don't know if it was Air Force or Naval Base in California, had a Jeep go through and hit an aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with an evaluation of the risks away from the ECPs to see really are there weaknesses elsewhere that you're really not evaluating? Um, no, that would not be my organization. That would not be PDC. Um, that's typically going to be um, either one, it's going to be like the Air Force Civil Engineering Center or each installation should have some kind of like area defense council, area based defense uh, coordinator, and that's the type of thing that they would be doing. Um, they would be looking outside of that ECF. They're looking to do, do I just have chain link fence in a location where, you know, a car can drive through it easily? They're the ones going to be looking at. Um, internal to the base, uh, we, we do belts and suspenders in our organization uh, all the time. So we have these ECF designs to stop their vehicles, but then you look outside every building and you're going to see bollards and planters and everything else to keep a vehicle from getting too close to that building. So we duplicate our efforts. So if somebody does get through the base, they're going to be hit with that then. Um, so no, that, that's going to be, like I said, uh, Corps of Engineers at Vicksburg probably would be looking at that a little bit, but that's outside of our, our realm. So. Anything else? Um, oh, yes, sir. Um, you're talking about how you have uh, Civilians working for the DOD as contractors. What's the split between civilian workers and, um, and those that are in the military? Active duty military, I think we're at about 1.3 million active duty military. I guess in your, your section. Oh, in my section. Well, okay. TEA. TEA has um, a little over 100, maybe 120 if you consider military. Most of us are civilian or contract employees. Um, so of that, uh, about 45, 50 of them are engineers, maybe 15 or 20 are actually suited, you know, uh, military. Uh, the rest of us are civilians um, and we have some contract support. Uh, for instance, uh, my contract support that I use for traffic engineering service, they're not even on site with us. It's uh, Gannett Fleming, they're out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They've been doing our work for us for, for a lot of years, and they have a whole staff of engineers. Um, within our area, we probably have maybe 30 to 40 contractors that aren't included in that 100 plus number. Um, so it depends on where you're at. If you go to some place like um, uh, the Missile Defense Agency's facilities at Redstone Arsenal, um, they have thousands of people, and most of those are contract employees. And one of the things, like even if you go overseas, you're going to see a lot more contractors and people not wearing uniforms than you would have 30 years ago in the military. Even things like aircraft maintenance or MRAP, uh, mine resistance, ambush prevention vehicles, um, are, are going to be done by contract employees a lot of time. Raytheon, Boeing, that type of thing. So the actual mix, I, I actually tried to find numbers on that. It was tough. <laughs> um, it's just not out there. Um, that, I don't know if anybody's read the news, they just did an audit of the DOD and, and we failed it. We knew we were going to fail it. Uh, but just that data collection of that aspect is extremely difficult. Uh, so, sorry, to, to answer your question, it's very, very difficult. It just depends on the organization you're in, um, uh, places like that. So, sorry. Any other questions? Right. Thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, I, I enjoy talking about my organization. I love what I do in traffic engineering, um, saving lives, uh, whether either side of it, I think is highly important. And it's just important whether you're working for the DOT 
uh, or whether you're working for, for my organization. I think that's one of the, uh, doesn't matter. Not just saving lives, protecting the, the occupants of vehicles as well. Um, I think that's one of the most important things we can do. Jason will be around for a few minutes after you have any questions. Thanks again. Thank you.